For as long as you've heard about Chanel, you have heard about tweed. And that's for good reason. It's been a staple of the house since Coco Chanel met tweed manufacturer William Linton and used his wool tweed in her work starting in 1924. So even if you are not a particular fan of the Chanel skirt suit look, I think all the viewers here can acknowledge that tweed can be quite beautiful and artful in and of itself, which you may know is far from its masculine origins as a durable favorite fabric of Scottish farmers. And Coco Chanel would hang out with a lot of guys who would wear it during horseback riding, a lot of Scottish dukes, even though we, we can't even really be certain that that actually happened because Coco Chanel was a, uh, a compulsive liar. No hate, that's in her biography. And when you think of Chanel, no one really thinks tomboy or masculine, but those really were the origins of the brand, recontextualizing men's wardrobes for women. Remarkably, this recontextualization has been so effective that nowadays a Chanel tweed jacket and skirt suit is thought of in many ways as kind of the height of feminine glamour. And these tweeds were intricate. The history of tweed, or Harris tweed, comes from an individual estate on a Scottish island that developed the first process of making tweed. On a little place called Lewis and Harris Island, they use natural dyes for their wool tweeds using local plants and lichen to create unique colors. Coco Chanel's personal favorite was a blend of wool and mohair ecru tweed that was handmade at their Linton manufacturer. And it was this, this protected artisanal process that led to a philosophy about artisanal processes at Chanel that extends to today, even, even though the scope has gotten a lot bigger. This philosophy encompasses the other prominent offerings from Chanel, jewelry, bags, shoes. This video is going to discuss the artisans that Chanel now owns, what they make, and why all of that matters. But okay, so even just saying that Chanel cares deeply about handcraft is sort of an understatement. Under the leadership of Karl Lagerfeld, Chanel began purchasing many ateliers that were responsible for creating the components of Chanel's haute couture that we know them for best now. Feather making, embroidery, ornamentation. You, you know what, actually, Let's just, let's just go through all of them. Let's list everybody out and specify what they do. These are the ateliers that make up Chanel's subsidiary company, Perfection. Get ready for just the best process footage you've ever seen in your life. Guillet is a fabric flower artisan. They have over 10,000 tools to create over 1,000 different types of florals used by Chanel. 10,000 tools? What do you need 10,000 different tools for? You need a more organized workspace. Their start was in the late 19th century making theater sets and then they gradually transitioned into making really extravagant window displays for brands like Yves Saint Laurent, Gucci, and Hermes. Fabrics are starched, cut into floral patterns, and then dyed. A trained artisan molds the petals and then binds them all together. It's really beautiful, detailed work. This stuff is great. The number of times that I have been stopped at an airport and had someone pull this out of my bag is hilarious. It truly does look like a weapon, but it is a tripod. And they're always like, like the security people always like back up when, because they, they always tell me to pull it out. They're always like, you pull it out. And I pull it out and I'm like, it's a tripod. And they're like, okay, open it then. It is a tripod. It's literally a tripod. And then they believe me. Hey, you should join my Patreon. That would be great. Please join my Patreon. It's the only way this channel is able to run. We, uh, we run on a really tight budget. We travel the world getting you information about fashion. We're the only ones in the industry that cover it this way. And if you like it, you should give us a few bucks a month. Patreon.com slash BlissFoster. Join my Patreon. It's not a threat. Koss is the Chanel-owned traditional glove maker whose work you have unknowingly seen for years on the hands of fashion's large language model insult bot, Karl Lagerfeld. He was a huge fan of the house and was always seen wearing their gloves. They make about 25,000 pairs per year and require their 30 artisans to have spent years perfecting the sometimes hundreds of skilled operations needed to complete a single pair before they are allowed to work on them. The Met has a ton of them on display, but if you ever want to see them up close, you can literally just go into their store in Paris. Next is one of the only non-French brands to be acquired by Perfection. It's a Scottish house called Barry. They're a cashmere knit house. It's, it's the oldest Scottish cashmere factory and also one of the last few remaining Scottish cashmere factories. 
it takes over a year of training for their artisans to be able to qualify to actually make the final product, like the curved neckline of some of their sweaters or the V-neck, for example. And that seems to be the thing that qualifies a lot of these houses as like ultra, ultra, ultra high end is that their employees can't even like get to work until they've spent a year or in some of these cases, years of training just doing the thing that the business does. Next up, Lesage. Oh wait, actually, we're, it's like a secret, right? So we need to, I'll take it again, hang on. The identity and work of the next brand is supposed to be a big old secret. So um, the next item on the list is a brand called Lesage, a maker of fine embroidery. So yeah, I mean, they're a maker of fine embroidery, but as of right now, Lesage is the creator of the most intricate, difficult, crazy, imaginative tweeds that have ever come out of Chanel or maybe any company ever. This stuff truly is, it's nuts. It's also an open secret that they do the embroidery for some of Daniel Roseberry's Scaparelli pieces and the, the tweeds for Tom Brown as well. What Lesage really offers as a company is their archive and their know-how. They have an archive of over 70,000 samples of different embroidery techniques that they've acquired from their own know-how and the acquisition of two different embroidery companies, one of which was done recently. It was a company called Linnell. Some other fun facts about them. Yves Saint Laurent, the man, would go and visit the Lesage archive before he would start new collections. And even now today, when you go into a Chanel store and ask to see a tweed bag, it is more than likely made of Lesage tweed. There's also one that's done in-house. It's a, a cheaper model of the tweed bag, but the, the hero bag that is made of tweed. That's Lesage, baby. Next up, Le Marier is also known for embroidery, but more notably for being the oldest feather maker in France. They got their start making specialty feathers for hats during the Belle Epoque, and they eventually added fabric flowers to their portfolio and are responsible for the Chanel camellias that you may know, may be aware of. If you have a fashion girlfriend, ask your fashion girlfriend, she knows about them. Fellas, get you a fashion wife. So obviously this is a hallmark of the Chanel brand and these these are the guy Le, Le Marier is these are the guys who created the legendary 16 petal design Atelier Montex is focused on a new grammar of embroidery. Montex has a look that is entirely their own due to their incorporation of a Cornelli embroidery machine that creates an embossed effect when used in conjunction with a top stitch or a chain stitch. We remember that top stitches are this, chain stitches are this. Right, so when this uses either a top stitch or a chain stitch, it's able to get this really crazy embossed effect and it, it no, I mean, noticeably, it looks very different. So this type of processing is widely used in the fashion world because it's able to fit in perfectly with embroideries and sequins. They're offering the very highly specialized use of a modern machine for embroidery, which allows them to create very intricate work outside the realm of hand embroidery that you find at, say, Lesage. I've also seen a lot of Dior products in recent seasons that seem to be using services from this house. We have no way of identifying that for sure, but Man, it really looks like it, doesn't it? Maison Michel is the milliner that is responsible for all of the hats that Chanel shows on the runway. They were responsible for the Chanel Henin, or the pointy princess hat, that was a huge hit three years ago, I'm told. Millinery has always been this very crucial additional component of runway shows and fashion more broadly. Maison Michel also sells incredibly gorgeous hats on their own website as well. Including this one, which I love because I, it just makes me so happy when like heritage artisanal storied houses that are so self-serious do one goofy thing. <laughs> It's so great. No, the hat with the little like cat ears. There's like one with little like pointy cat ears on it, but it's like a handmade straw hat. Goosens is the Chanel jewelry maker and they are my favorite on this list because their name contains the word goose. They are a gold plating and silversmithing company. Their signature look is using traditional jewelry making techniques with glass and rock crystals, semi-precious stones, quartz, and cultured pearls to create this intricate Byzantine layered ornate jewelry look that you see at every Chanel show. And for anyone not aware, Byzantine is not just a vibey adjective, it is an actual genre of jewelry. Massaro is the shoemaker that developed Coco Chanel's iconic two-tone sandal. Obviously that is a super iconic part of the brand's history, but a fun little interesting thing, the fact that they own Massaro means that they get a little bit of a leg up when it comes to the runway shows themselves. If you watch a lot of behind the scenes for runway shows, you'll notice that shoes are often very tricky where the number of shoes that they've ordered do not necessarily match the models who were cast after those shoes got ordered. So, 
Sometimes it ends up that models who have size six feet are wearing size eight shoes. But if you've ever seen a Loic Prigent video, behind the scenes at a Chanel runway show, everyone is suspiciously calm. And I have a feeling that part of that is because they own a shoe manufacturer and have as many shoes as they could possibly need and ask the girls what quarter size shoe they are so that they can fit them perfectly for their walk. Actual facts. I'm, I'm almost positive that the, the quarter size thing is true. So it, it takes them 30 hours to make women's shoes and 50 hours to make men's shoes. Also, when Coco Chanel first designed the two-tone thing where the, you know, the black fabric on the front, she said that it was meant to make feet appear smaller. And that, I think, is because we all know what the, the truth of this is, and that is that Coco Chanel hated people with big feet. She hated them. Atelier Langan is one of the newer acquisitions from Chanel, and they are a traditional pleating house. The process here is unbelievable. This is maybe my favorite one. They place any type of fabric into these specific pleated molds, and they get baked inside an oven to create these beautiful handmade pleats with a ton of variety. One that you may remember from a few years ago was that Dior men's show that had those just insane jacket detail that no one could figure out where it was actually coming from. I'm almost positive because if you line up the video footage from different stuff from the atelier itself and then also the Dior behind the scenes stuff, you see some of the same employees, same table, I'm cracking your code. I know what's going on. But I mean, in seriousness, these pleat details really look like they take on a life and movement of their own when the model is in motion. It's truly beautiful stuff. And this is actually a really interesting time for us to transition and talk about the politics of the metier d'art. You, do you want me to just say dart? So a lot of these ateliers used to work for Miss Coco Chanel herself, right? And as the haute couture industry started to decline financially, so also did many of these houses. You can tell that most readily because if you look at the history of many of these ateliers, they had to shift up what they were offering in order to keep the business afloat. And I mean, if the market takes out the artisans, then there's no one left to create the haute part of haute couture. It would destroy it. And more so, it would sort of destroy Chanel. It's a house that's fixative on its haute couture as the vehicle to sell the ready-to-wear, the shoes, the perfume, the jewelry, the makeup. If the haute couture isn't artisanally crafted, then Chanel's status as the end-all, be-all of couture will not stay that way because you can't sell Chanel's price point without a very, very good reason. A couture collection with no savoir-faire makes selling Chanel number no. 5 to women who want to bask in the vision of Chanel much more difficult. And not all of Chanel's products are made to the couture standard, which is totally fine, but that certainly doesn't help those products move off the shelves if there's no perception of couture at the top of the company. Not that we talk about business very much on this channel, but if we're talking about the absolute top of French clothes making, it's Dior and Chanel. But those two businesses operate very differently from one another. Chanel is privately owned. Dior is owned by LVMH. So the way that Chanel positions itself as better than its major competitor is this. Dior may have LVMH with their seeming inability to fail and their infinite resources and their reputation for owning the brands with the longest histories and heritage, but Chanel has the best French artisans on their payroll. Even when Dior wants to use those artisans, and they do, Chanel gets cut into that deal. And so they end up sort of occupying this king role in French clothes making. So ultimately, that, that I think is what you are, whether you know it or not, that's what you're paying for when you're buying Chanel stuff. This romantic notion that all these highly skilled teams with centuries old knowledge all come together to create the essence of this brand. I'm not too plugged into being a, a bag person, but even I have heard of the crazy Chanel price increases. And with the acquisition of all these ateliers and building the state-of-the-art facility in the Parisian suburbs that they house all of those in, it becomes obvious what you're paying for with those price increases. What you pay for when you buy a Chanel bag is heritage. You buy the literal heritage of the past, those companies, and you are buying their heritage into the future as they're being preserved. And a lot of brands do like to talk about heritage in broad, vague terms, but in, in the case of Chanel, it's actually true. Also, Coco Chanel was a Nazi. Have a good day.